Hi, welcome to uh, this podcast today. Um, welcome, Piers and Ben. Um, so let me just introduce myself first of all. I'm Zena Mee from um, Eldership for Leaders, and we're going to do a very kind of short podcast today because I've got something really exciting to um, share with you, um, and actually it's something that's come through our community as well. So um, these guys are, are on a mission to um, create a film um, and produce a film around boarding skills and the effect that that has on leaders. Um, and our lovely Simon Chinnery, who's in our group, is in our eldership group, introduced me to these guys because myself and Simon have been talking about this subject for quite some time now. And, um, and then he introduced me to these guys who are actually doing a film about it, which is really exciting. So why am I interested in this field? So having been working for lead, with leaders for 30 years, um, one of the things that started to emerge for me is kind of noticing the educational backgrounds of the people that I was working with, particularly at the very senior level, and therefore then kind of the lens that they look, look through the world at. Um, and um, I started to become really interested, particularly when we're looking at things systemically about how those leaders um, actually um, use that lens in which to then lead and create cultures in their organizations or institutions or even communities. Um, so for myself personally, I've been to four different um, types of schools and different education systems. So education systems are very something that, that are very much kind of present in the work that I do in, in the field that I work in as well. And just kind of noticing how those different systems um, if you like, the rules of belonging in those systems is, uh, and why they're so important in terms of the way then cr cultures are created. Um, so why am I doing this podcast for you guys is to actually bring your awareness to this, because I think it's something that we don't consciously look at in terms of the education systems and how they affect our leaders. Um, although we are, I'm noticing it is kind of coming into our conversations much more in the public domain. Um, I also want to raise awareness to this amazing work that Ben and Piers are, are actually doing and um, to also think about our work and think about the leaders that we're working with um, and thinking about where they come from, because I don't think we think about that. I think we've, we're very focused on where they're trying to get to and what their visions may be for their organisations or for themselves. But we don't always ask the, the questions around where they come from or what their ancestral history is as well. So I'm going to hand over now to Ben and Piers just to introduce themselves and give you a little bit of background about themselves. So Ben, would you like to tell us a little bit about you first? Yes. Uh, thanks so much, Zena, for, for having us on, on here on this podcast. Um, I'm essentially a storyteller. I've been involved in... Uh, documentary filmmaking for 45 years and I'm a set and before before that I was a professional actor so I studied Shakespeare and I studied studied lots of very classical plays and I became fascinated with the stories of leadership really of the archetype of the king uh, who's in many Shakespeare plays, they've, um, they always have a magician character standing behind them, giving them advice. And it's very modelled on that uh, corporate structure. Um, and uh, I actually went to boarding school when I was 11 years old. And I was uh, very, very influenced by the education that I got there, which wasn't in my judgment, very good. Um, and I met Piers on a men's workshop. And Piers talked to me about his podcast uh, about boarding schools. And I went, oh, I went to boarding school and uh, I had a pretty terrible time there. And he said, oh, why didn't you come along on a, onto a podcast? And when I, when I actually sat down with him and told my story, um, I realised I had a huge aha moment about how boarding schools were actually designed for leadership. To get in when a child is from six years old and to start to train up 
that British character of, of leadership. Um, and so Piers suggested to me that um, we make a documentary and that was part of my uh, interest and we've been doing it now for 18 months. And uh, it's a fascinating and amazingly rich subject. And I believe will change our concept of who we vote into leadership and who what what we see leadership as. Um, Piers, how about how about you? Mm, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Zena. Yeah. So for me, you know, I train corporately, so I went to business school in Europe, uh, in France, one of the top business schools there, and then in London. And then I worked in the city, worked in Paris as well. And it was after I had a breakdown um, in the year 2000 that I, and you know, I went through a very dark period for a, a number of years. I was basically homeless. I struggled with addictions and eventually found myself in a Buddhist monastery in 2002. I came across a book. Uh, called The Making of Them by Nick Duffel. And at that point, suddenly I realized the reason I was such a mess was due to, in part, my boarding school experiences. And it was a huge aha moment. Um, and, you know, I went to boarding school from age 11 through till 18. On the surface, I'd been seen as a success. I was good at sports. I was in a band, I was a drum major, leading out the marching band. But after my breakdown, after I started to, to explore this stuff, I realized that actually I'd had a horrific time. I just suppressed it. I dissociated. And in the last few years, there's been a lot of sexual abuse, which has come to the surface at my school. And so, you know, on leaving the monastery, I was there for three and a half years. I started to explore my own boarding school. I started to work as a coach, mainly with leaders, uh, executives. And it, very quickly, as I started to share my boarding school story, more and more of my clients were boarding school. And therefore, as I was seeing it with my, my clients, then I was kind of making the understanding that so many of our leaders, I mean, huge amounts have been to boarding school. So I started to ask these questions. I did start the podcast. We started the film with Ben and Simon Hinckley. And... Yeah, I'm just so passionate that people understand the impact because there is a, a big impact to boarding school that we don't talk about. Yeah. And um, so that that's really my journey. And that's my one to one work as I work as an executive coach and run a podcast and I do men's circles for ex boarders. So all of my focus is boarding school now. Brilliant. So you've really got a niche there, Piers, haven't you now? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, in the men's work, Robert Bly talks about this idea that wherever our wound is, that is where the gift, our greatest gift to give to a society. In Sufism, they talk about where the wound is, where the scar is, that's where the light enters. Mm -hmm. And so that's really my passion is because of what went I went through. I lost a friend to suicide at boarding school and I was sexually abused while I was there. Mm -hmm. And it deeply impacted me. So I try to take my own life in my 20s. Mm. You know, and so it's like, and I speak to many clients who have similar issues. Mm. You know, alcoholism, addictions, um, you know, struggle in relationships, struggle to feel their emotions, workaholism, inability to relax. These things, these are common patterns for people who've been to boarding school. We call them symptoms. Yeah. And I think obviously there's so much talk at the moment about kind of male suicide particularly and, and how, how big it is, but there's no kind of deeper questions about where this is being driven from, what what are the deeper things that may be occurring or the the patterns that may be there that, that people are living by, which are, people are not being consciously aware of. So there's this kind of concept of mental health without really truly understanding that actually we talk, what we're talking about is trauma. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about trauma that people that's hidden and that people even in themselves may be not even consciously aware of. So it's fantastic that you're doing this work to make um, 
leaders become consciously aware and act to be even be able to label things as trauma and understand therefore how it's affected them and uh, yeah that's absolutely fantastic so okay, okay let me just speak a bit to that that um mm. Uh, Nick Duffel talks about uh, a survival personality. So if we go through trauma as a young child, uh, especially when we don't have um, anywhere to go after the trauma, we have no one to talk to. If we're at a boarding school, which is in a, in a sense an orphanage, um, and some some call it a prison, um uh, Stephen Fry uh, in his uh, biography talks about prisons are like boarding school and boarding schools are like prisons and the problem with that is that you are trapped around your trauma bullying or sexual abuse or just being separated from your parents uh 24 hours a day and that results in us designing a survival personality and that we are then coached. Well, my mother used to say to me, oh, going to boarding school is good character building stuff. Well, uh, what is that character? And essentially, if we step back and see the bigger picture and the historical picture, boarding schools were designed for the empire. When people went abroad to become part of an expat community abroad and worked in British councils and, 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 and politics. And, and they, they had to do pretty atrocious things to indigenous populations in order to control. And what happened to their children? Well, they were sent to what was essentially a public school, a private, expensive school. And they were trained to take over from their parents in that leadership role and that did not that that trauma of being separated from you know as a six-year-old let's let's make it simple here as a six-year-old the best toy you have is your teddy bear and your bedroom is a sacred space a safe space and then the first night you go into the dormitory and we heard from one person that their on their first night, their teddy bear was taken away from them and hung with a noose outside the window of the dormitory. Mm. And it, it remained there as a reminder of what had been taken away from that child. And I, I can remember my first night in that dormitory. Uh, one, one guy in our film on the first night, the the uh, the master that looks after 60 students, that he's the kind of surrogate parent for them, came into the dormitory and asked the 30 boys in the dormitory, is anyone still awake? Well, it was Edinburgh's academy and the fireworks were going on and there was music outdoors and, and none of those children had ever spent time you know they'd always been on their own in their own own bedroom and suddenly they were in a room with 30 other kids and so all of the children raised their hand and said yes sir we're awake and so he invited them out got them out of their beds took them down to the pool hall put their heads under the table and beat them with a with a pool cue and the message of that is you're in my kingdom now I'm in control. And if you do anything out of order, well, we will give you some pain and trauma. So that then the child has to develop a personality of let's let's survive. Let's find a way of keeping calm and carry on those kind mm. of cliches. And that that is designed throughout the whole school and I can name lots of lots of famous people you know David Cameron was given a a plate of food with maggots in it in his first term and he lost a stone in weight well that was kind of a quarter of his weight mm -hmm. at the age of six and it's like those kinds of experiences make us disassociate from vulnerability and feelings and that's often seen as a tremendous leadership quality 
I'm tough, I'm strong, I'm capable, I don't, I don't show my vulnerability. Um, and let's face it, that's an old paradigm that is no longer seen as human. Mm. And in I in my model of leadership, uh whenever I'm leading, I like to give people permission to be vulnerable. The only thing my father really ever taught me was that he, at Lloyd's insurance firm, he used to have a meeting every week and ask people, how difficult is it to do your job? And what do you need to make it better? And this was innovative in his day. <laughs> Nobody ever did that. But don't what? talk about your feelings. <laughs> yeah, don't we talk about how difficult my job is? No one ever talk. No, you only ever give a report about how marvelous everything is. Mm. So it's it's um that survival personality goes on, and mm. our vulnerabilities as a child during trauma is locked away, and it's only twenty to forty years later that we suddenly realize our lives are a bit compromised. Mm. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the saying that kind of comes into my head from what, what you're saying as well, Ben, is that stiff upper lip that we talk about, mm. this, this mm. stiff upper lip. And, you know, and the other one that, that, that kind of springs to mind is this man up, <laughs> this mm -hmm. stiff upper lip man up. And so it's kind of a version in a way, isn't it, of of kind of, but, but I, I, a fascinating with this connection of being British in this is it, there's something about identity for me as you're talking, mm. you know, kind of get, get that, that, you know, when, when, if you like, you haven't formed your identity fully, you're being taken into this institution, um, you know, this orphanage and then trying to work out what, who, are, who am I in this space? Because you've been taken away, ripped away from the family system in terms of, you know, where you, um, if you like, where you've come into the world and where you belonged. So that kind of working out what's my identity, and obviously that's not a conscious thought, kind of springs to mind as well. Um, yeah. So who am I? I think for me, my experience at boarding school is that the question you ask is not who am I, it's who do they need me to be? Right. Who do I need to be, in, like Ben's just said, in order to survive? Nick Duffel in his work he says you know everyone who goes to boarding school not everyone is traumatized but everyone has to survive and so you know George Monbiot the um, the journalist talks about that that you go from into an institution you know when you're at home you can negotiate with your parents oh I want to go out well not tonight maybe tomorrow whereas in a boarding school you get to an institution there's no negotiation that's the rule and there's no love, as George Monbiot says, there's no love there. A child needs love. There's no developmental psychologist or children's development which recommends taking children from their parents. None. The children are spending nine months on their own in an institution. And what, you know, for me, the big thing about boarding school, as I'm doing the film and the research, is neglect. You might not have been sexually abused. But you were neglected. If you imagine as a parent, you've got, say, two children. Are you spending enough time with them? Most people will say, no, I could do with spending more time. You add in another 48 children. Which is what happens in these boarding schools. Well, most of them are going to get neglected. Mm. And therefore, as, as uh, Ben just said about David Cameron, that was neglect. Losing a stone in weight, you know, mm. but. I have a whole bookshelf up here of stories of Richard Branson. Same thing. He was beaten until he bled from age seven at boarding school. Gabriel Byrne, Stephen Fry, John Peel, Bear Grylls. He was beaten until his shoulder nearly snapped. Mm. You know, these are the Tony Blair tried to skip the country, tried to run away. Mm. Yeah. And according to Panorama, which came out a month ago, he was there at the time of huge sexual abuse. Could that have been a reason he ran away? Mm. We don't know. He never, he doesn't talk about that in his biography. And, and I, th I think this is really pertinent because I think there's not talking about it. Yeah. There's this huge fear of, yeah. and I, I think there's not talking about it because 
you know, and this is my perception of it because of the potential shame and that that's kind of shifting ident- identity when you have to integrate something that's so traumatic. Um, you know, it's it, it's more comfortable to stay in that survivor self. Mm. Um, but also, I I also wonder whether because when in when when we think about things systemically, we also talk about loyalty and hidden loyalties. So you know, you're being brought up in these boarding schools, if you like, to be loyal to that system, just like you would, just like we're being asked to be loyal to our parental system. Mm. But but at a very young age, you're being kind of taken out of your your ancestral system but still being loyal to it by joining this other organization this other institution and having to be loyal to that as well so there's like this entanglement somehow between the Mm. the education system and the family system they almost don't feel separate to me as you're talking they almost feel entangled so suddenly I'm you know the Mm. world that exists are these these systems these two huge systems Mm -hmm. um and therefore this need to belong in it in order to get a sense of who you are in it as well so i'm kind of wondering you know when we're talking about them not talking about it the likes of the politicians and so on or if they do talk about it one of the things i noticed they talk about it in a very kind of kind of almost like it was the making of me (laughs) kind Mm -hmm. of conversation you know um like like often you see in in military s- scenarios like you know well actually that's what made me a man or made me grow up or whatever um but i'm kind of you know wondering about that loyalty about that how how what you know what maybe what was that like for you guys in terms of because obviously talking about this i'm sensing we'll feel disloyal on some level maybe not so much now but i'm sure there was a threshold cross somewhere that went oh gosh you know, this is going to be disloyal both to my my family system, my ancestral system, and the uh, the the school and the the boarding school system as a whole. Ben, do you want to answer that? Uh, at my boarding school, we had a rule that was the biggest rule in the school, which is you don't split on someone, you don't tell tales. If something awful happens to you from a master or a fellow student, you don't tell anybody. And you were seen as a hero if you didn't do that. Now, take that on a step. Uh, Take that into leadership within a company. Uh, My stepfather was the financial director of uh, Garrard's Jewelers. And the father and son CEO of Garrard's Jewelers was discovered to uh, be stealing diamonds and marking them down as lost. And this was about £200,000 a year. Now, nobody, everybody knew about it. and No one ever said anything. And when he contacted the police, because he was the financial director of the company, he was sacked and mm-hmm. told you are, you are not welcome in this company anymore. Now, what's the message that gives to young employees and younger people coming up into leadership, i.e. you can do anything you like as long as you're not caught? And that at my boarding school and that in many of the uh, film companies and the film productions that I've been involved with, uh, there is a lot of covering up. There's a lot of, you know, let's let's keep the reputation of the school, of the company, let's keep that clean. And therefore it all goes underground. And as we know in systems, in management systems in this country, if there is theft and if there is the the laws are broken within a company well that can create uh the collapse of a whole system mm. well it's, it creates a trauma in the system yeah uh, and the that, system that is covered up it's shoved in a box it's put in pandora's box in the side of the office and what happens is that starts to rot the system from the inside mm. So accountability um, is a huge thing nowadays in some of the work that Piers and I do. do. You know, if we if I am accountable, if imagine if, uh, you know, Boris Johnson, I saw him when he was mayor on a TV program 
and the the interviewer said to him what do you do if you don't know the answer to a question and boris said on open tv i make it up mm. in other words i i lie and we're we're taught that in debating society at school it doesn't matter you've got to win it doesn't matter if you're telling the truth you've got to just win your argument mm. um in the law system the same thing. Deals are made outside of the law. If you can come to a deal, it doesn't matter if the law is broken or, or if there's bribery involved as long as there is acceptance. And this is integrated in the tuck shop at boarding school. You know, kids used to steal sweets and then resell them in the in the dormitories. And everybody knew about it, but nobody was prepared to do anything because of this sacred law of I'm not going to tell tales, I'm not going to split. So if a child is traumatized at boarding school and they and they learn they mustn't tell anyone, mm. how, what's the survival personality that's going to grow out of that? Mm. And what is the, the country is now up in arms is about our politicians covering things up, releasing scandal, which will then cover up something they're doing, uh, offshore bank accounts, um, expenses, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and, and people get away with it because they've got privilege and money and power. Mm. And I, I, I mean, it's so pertinent, this. I mean, the time that we're actually talking about this as well, because this week we've had the story of the post office and what's happened in the post office and you know and there's obviously a lot of energy of thinking how 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 have they got away with this how this how's this happened and how they're continuing to get away with it but it, in a way it is very much the story that you're talking about that's where it comes from you know I mean, a, a, a public school you're you, you're a fag in the second year of my school you were basically a slave to a sick form mm -hmm. right and, me, and they the could do anything in fourth year. Yeah, they could do anything to you. They could beat you. They could, you had to do exactly what they were told. You were told, and that's a child being being told, uh, he's a god. He's he has power over you. He's he, bigger than you. He's bigger than you, and he can do whatever he likes because he has authority over you. Wow. And if you're not allowed to tell anyone, if you're not allowed. If that person is not made accountable for their actions, then that goes through the spine of all British society. And no longer is this relevant. We don't have an empire anymore. We don't need to go abroad and do atrocious things to great huge groups of people and, and have a lack of empathy. Mm. Um, yeah, but I suppose, again, it's that loyalty but it's an unconscious loyalty, isn't it? As in, like, people don't even realise they're being loyal to these things. So this is why the work that you're doing, and obviously this film, is is so important to um, to illuminate this loyalty, this hidden loyalty that people often don't realise that they have. Yeah, and the biggest problem is that no one talks about. It. Yeah. So the film has is is spearheading a movement to. Um, to get uh, to be accountable and to um, you know at the moment maybe your your listeners don't understand but but there's no it's not law to mandatory report an abuse in boarding school or any school or any school so that's then sent you go to the police station and say I was sexually abused I was beaten whatever uh, now if that was happening in society that person would be arrested but no. The police would then turn around and say, well, you need to take it back to the school. So it's mm -hmm. it's kept within that institution, within the walls of the school. So we're we are we are campaigning for mandatory reporting of any kind of abuse. Now, in um, uh, in Piers's boarding school, there's was is it Piers 11 uh, tutors are, have been prosecuted for abuse. So six, six are either in prison or, and then another five. Um, so six of my actual teachers, and then another five have been arrested and either imprisoned or, yeah. you know, uh, I think one didn't go to prison, but I think five of my actual teachers are in prison at the moment for anything from ten to 
20 years for rape and abuse and things like that. So many tutors that are discovered who have abused children are not made accountable, are not sent to the police. They're given a glowing report and being told to get a job at another school. So that's like giving them permission to go off and carry on that kind of behavior with other children at other schools. And this is a pandemic mm -hmm. amongst, amongst mm -hmm. them. And that's what it was shown in the panorama, you know, that at Edinburgh Academy, uh, Nikki Campbell's school, you know, yeah. it was Ian Wares, who was uh, abusing people in that school, they gave him a glowing reference and he went to Fetis, where Tony Blair was. Mm. And, wow. you know, and he carried on abusing there until he then was given a glowing reference, went to South Africa. Mm. And, I, you know, this that kind of resonates with me in terms of how that then translate in other systems, in other systems, in other educational systems. And, um, you know, I wrote a newsletter um, last week around um, to my community around the work that I'd done in a, in a school with the leaders. And I discovered that there was horrific bullying and terrible things happening amongst the staff, the leadership um, mm -hmm. that was, that was being then, um, filtered out to the parents so the parents were terrified of of, of the the school and the, the teachers and so on as well and when I reported that to Ofsted uh, they said well you need to report that to the police so I reported it to the police and when I reported it to the police the police said well we can't get in to talk to Ofsted they won't speak to us about it so there was no way in and so this just continued yeah. Um, and that you know, and and it was so. Yeah, I just had to basically walk away from that. Wow. Um, and the local authorities were involved in it. They knew about it um, because it's actually been in the newspaper, the local newspapers as well, mm -hmm. and they'd done nothing about it. So it just shows you how all this not telling and people being enmeshed in in the system, so that you know, to not to make sure nothing gets exposed, if you like, of of, of this nature. Is not it kind when... of filters all the way through society, doesn't it? In all the, because our education system looks up to the boarding school system. It says this is what you know. When Michael Go took over, he said, "This is what we need. We need to 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 bring that public school system throughout the whole of the education system." And so it gets repeated. Those those kind of rules of belonging gets yeah. filtered into into those systems. When you when you educate a child or a teenager that you are now a privileged person, so the rules don't apply to you, so you can go and have a party in your study, even though there is a pandemic going on in the school and uh, nobody's allowed to socialise and everybody's got to go to their boarding school, they've got to go to their dormitory and, and isolate themselves. Well, if that happens in public school and then you have a pandemic and you're the prime minister and you have parties in, then you, you're going to automatically assume, well, I'm a privileged person. It doesn't it doesn't work for me. And yeah. then you might get an inquiry of your mates who are at the same school as you. And then nothing happens. It's just a big hoo-ha, a bit of a drama comes out and then everybody decides, oh, that's been happening. And people keep voting. I mean, one of the one of the missions of our movement is to educate the public that these these survival personalities grown of trauma at boarding schools where everybody is trained to be a leader. Well, you know. We need to recognize that these people are traumatized, that these people are loyal only to their classmates and to their class, as it were, to the others that are privileged. And we need to stop voting for them because they're not serving us. They're serving their classmates, the, the clique, the, the niche that they, that they, uh, that they serve. Mm. Um, and I I grew up believing that politicians were actually public servants serving the population. <laughs> I didn't realise it was the other way around. And I think they think that because I've read David Cameron's book or Tony Blair's, they really feel 
they're doing it for the greater good but yeah. the, the thing with trauma that if you don't deal with trauma then it as Jung said the psychological rule states that when an inner situation is not made conscious it happens outside of fate they think they're doing the best but they can't because of that wounding that the wound the main wound from boarding school is i'm not good enough i'm not loved and i've got to prove to the world and i'll do it whatever means possible if i have to lie you know so i think that's the thing they think they're doing the best but until they heal their trauma then it will keep playing out keep playing out and yeah we just got to stop voting for these people or they need to do their inner work yeah and, and also it's it's not just the people is it? it's the whole system because this is what the whole system has been built on hasn't it do you know what I mean? So the whole political system, the economic system, the socioeconomic system, it's all built on this premise of the boarding school structure and the system. That's absolutely amazing. Thank you, guys. I know we could talk about this forever. And, um, you know, so you've, it's been brilliant to have this opportunity just to kind of get you guys here to to introduce this um, to, this idea to people and how important this film is as well. Um, so just a few things i just wanted to say just just to end um if you are interested in kind of learning more about this field in from an eldership point of view then come join the community and there'll be a link below in the um in in the comments and also i'll also put the link into the film and if you would like to contribute to this film and getting this film made please please do that no matter how much money you have to offer just that little contribution it's it's us kind of basically putting our our presence in this space to say let's do our little bit to transform this and if we all do that together then you know something will change so thank you so much guys and um thank yeah you. i really value all, all the work that you're doing uh, I, I, I just if Piers needs to go i just like to end on a little story if i may yeah, yes. I do need to, to go. So. Oh, we'll say goodbye to Piers and then we'll leave Ben on the yeah. story. Thank yeah. you, Piers. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a storyteller and there is, uh, I'm fascinated with eldership. And um, I'm going to tell you a little story about a king who lives in a castle and he's old now and he's had to, he's had many, many battles and scars and um, in the court, his court jester uh, keeps taking the piss out of him and saying that they ought to swap crowns because the jester wears these floppy crowns with little ring bells on it. And um, because he's going senile and he doesn't, he can't rule the kingdom anymore. And this is upsetting the king. And the king finds that whereas when he was younger, he he had he could control his emotions. Uh, now he can't control his emotions and he starts getting upset. So he often takes a break and goes into the gardens of the castle, which have high walls around it where he feels safe. And he tries to find a place where he can have a little cry uh, because he knows he's losing his power. And he also is terribly scared of the army of young men who are trying to break down the walls and the and the doors of the castle to take over and cause a revolution and he's scared of this he doesn't know how to how to handle this most of his soldiers are aging now so he goes into the garden and everywhere he goes he sees this little old man with a floppy hat the gardener and he's trying to get a quiet space and everywhere he goes into the maze and he gets to the center of the maze and there is the gardener pruning a, a flower and the gardener comes up to him and says what 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 ails you what what's your pain you look sad king and the king goes what do, do you understand you're the gardener you shovel shit and plant little seeds all day long i mean what would you know about running a kingdom about having people trying to take over your power. And the gardener listens to his woes and he says, let me introduce myself. I used to be the king. And I am here now to mentor you 
out of your leadership and into eldership. And eventually you will take my place in the garden as a gardener, planting new seeds. And you, I will mentor you to open up the doors of your castle and allow those revolutionary young men in and offer your wisdom and experience so that they don't make the same mistakes. They don't make the promises that you can't deliver on and you can end up mentoring them into leadership so that they are better leaders than you. And the, the king, sure enough, spends every afternoon from that moment on studying with the old king, the, the new gardener. And one day the gardener falls and hands on his staff to the king. And the king opens the doors and allows the young people in and, and, and schools them and mentors them in the mistakes that he made so that they don't make those. <laughs> That's a lovely story. Thank you, Ben. And thanks for ending on that. All right. It's Take been care. a pleasure.